where the atomic diagram is completed. Um, so, so the talk is mostly going to be about sort of trees and these reductions between classes of structures, uh, but we need some examples of, of properties that structures can have. Uh, and so the two we're going to think about are, are the degree spectrum. Right? So the degree spectrum is the set of all of the degrees D, where D computes a copy of the structure A. Um, and, and there's a theorem of Knight that says this is essentially equivalent to the, the degrees, not, not just the computer copy of A, but the, the degrees of copies of A. Uh, and the other kind of property we're going to talk about uh, is for a computable structure is the computable dimension. Uh, and this is the number of different computable copies of the structure up to computable isomorphism. Um, so it doesn't really matter if you don't know too much about these, they're just going to sort of be examples of, of properties the structures can have. Uh, so looking at computable dimension one or omega, um, so these are sort of all mostly old results. Um, for a lot of structures, right, like dimension one, which means that there's only one computable copy, this is computably categorical, or dimension omega, which means that there's infinitely many different computable copies. These are, are easy to construct examples of. And in fact, in a lot of natural classes, these are the only two possibilities. So, so in all of these classes here, algebraically close fields, uh, things like abelian groups, linear orders, the only two possible computable dimensions are either one or omega. So there's some kind of uh, structure going on, right? These are, are very structured classes. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Gontrov was able to construct a, a structure that had computable dimension n for any finite n. So for example, there, there's some structure that has two different computable copies that aren't computably isomorphic, but those are the only two, right? So any other computable copy is isomorphic to one of those two. Um, so that's a, a quite complicated proof, right? Because it's, it's some proof that you can't do in those, those structures, uh, those classes of structures from the, the previous slide. Uh, and then once, once Gontraff had this example, uh, Gontraff together with some other people, right? They went around and they said, okay, uh, you know, here's this one example. Let's use the same kind of techniques and let's make the structure to be a graph. Right, so a graph with computable dimension two, and let's make a lattice with computable dimension two, and a partial order with computable dimension two, and so on. Right, so there's there's certain classes where they, the the classes had enough sort of coding potential in the classes that they could create these examples inside of those classes. Right, so we sort of have now a, a splitting of the classes. Right, there's there's the classes that are sort of restricted. Right, they can only have dimension one or omega, and there's the classes that are sort of less restricted, have more coding ability. Um, and they have examples of, of all the different computable dimensions. And the same thing sort of happened over and over again with all sorts of other kinds of properties, um, right? So for example, coming up with certain kinds of degree spectra and so on. And sort of what people noticed is that the, the split of things that, uh, you know, always you could find the example in these classes and the things where you couldn't find an example, um, they tended to split sort of along the same lines, right? Of course, though, Sometimes there's an example, like for, for something like linear orders, sometimes there's an example of something in the linear order, but then there's other things where you can't come up with a linear order. But, but the same group of structures uh, always was there as the, the things where you could always find an example. And informally, we call these, these kinds of structures universal, right? And the idea is basically any kind of example uh, that you could come up with of, of, of a structure of some kind, there is a structure in this universal class that has the same property. Right, so they're, they're, they're the sort of the structures that have enough like coding power that, that, that anything you could code into any structure, you could encode in this, this particular kind of structure. Um, right, and so, so you've got these classes, right, so graphs, partial orders, integral domains, and so on, that, that, that seemed like they were universal. Um, and what you could do, right, is, is every time you built some new example, like maybe a new kind of graph, you could then take whatever the construction was, like analyze the construction, and turn that construction to construction of a, a lattice or a partial order or, or any of these kinds of universal classes. Um, but this isn't really that attractive a way of doing things, right? Because it means that you're sort of doing this ad hoc method for every example you come up with, you're coming up with a, a new argument that you can make a lattice. And what would be a lot better is to come up with some kind of general construction that, that transfers all these properties at once, right? So some way of taking a graph and turning it into a lattice and, and it transfers all the properties of the graph over to that lattice, right? And then you have something that sort of, you, you understand what's going on more. Uh, you don't have to do these sort of ad hoc techniques of, of analyzing particular constructions, right? You have some kind of general idea of what's going on. Um, and so there's this paper of, of Hirschfeld, Kusain, of Shore, and Slinko when they, they did this sort of thing. So I said, say you have a class C of structures. Um, you, so you basically they picked a bunch of properties of computable structures. So they picked uh, degree spectra, 
the computable dimension, and a few other things, right? And they said that the class C is complete with respect to all of these, right? So complete with respect to, to this list of properties. If any time you have a countable graph G, you can find some structure in your class that has all of the same properties from this list, right? So, so G and A have the same degree spectrum. Um, if, if you start with a computable graph, then the computable dimension of the graph and the, the structure in the class is the same, right? If you expand them by constants, they still have the same computable dimension. If you take any relation on the graph, then you can find a relation on the other structure that's the same, right? So essentially, basically, this is saying that, that for any graph, there's some structure in your class C that's, that's up to computability theoretic properties, the same as, as the graph G. Um, and, and why graphs? So, so graphs themselves are universal, right? So, so if you take any structure of any kind, you can code it up by a graph. And this is something sort of the, the model theorists have known for I don't know, 50, 60, many, many, many years, right? That, that you can always code any kind of structure into a graph. So you could replace, right? Instead of saying any countable graph, you could say any countable structure of any kind. Uh, and of course, right, the, this was the, the list of properties of, of computably theoretic properties that they had in this paper. And you can add all sorts of other properties. You can add things like Scott rank and, and, this, and, and basically any, any reasonable computably theoretic property you, you want, right? And the, the idea is that completeness should capture any property that, that's reasonable that you might think of ever. Um, and then they showed that there, there are things that are complete in this sense, right? So, so all of these classes of structures that, that we had before, uh, these are complete with respect to all of these properties. Right, so, so graphs, partial orderings, lattices, integral domains, punitive semigroups, uh, two-step nilpotent groups. Right, any example you come up with of a structure, there's, there's an example in, in these classes. And right, as I said, so, so not only are they complete with respect to this list of properties, but they, they turn out to be complete with respect to sort of any other reasonably computably theoretic property that we can think of, right? which is, is not sort of a formal definition of a property, but, but sort of anything that seems reasonable, uh, they're complete with respect to those properties as well. So we've got this list of things that are complete. We've got some examples of things that are, are not complete, right? Because for example, to be complete, you have to have structures of finite computable dimension. And we had a list of things where you couldn't, right? You could only have dimension one or omega. So those things can't be complete. Uh, so this is sort of a, a sense of, of sort of reductions, right? We're reducing structures to structures of another kind. And, and there's lots of these kinds of things in, in logic and in various areas of logic where we're, we're taking structures of one kind and we're coding them into structures of another kind. So from descriptive set theory, you've got uh, this, this sort of theory of Borel reductions. Right? So what is that? So, so you take two classes of structures, C and D, and you want to ask whether where C is Borel reducible to D. Right? And what it means to be a Borel reducible is that there's a Borel operator that takes structures from C and gives you structures from D. And it uh, maintains the isomorphisms. Right? So, if you start with two structures that are isomorphic, then you get two structures that are isomorphic in, in D. And if you start with two structures that are not isomorphic, then you get two non-isomorphic structures, right? And the idea is that the, this reduces the, the isomorphism, the problem of finding isomorphisms from the class C to the class D. Right? So the way you can think of it is, um, imagine that you had a good understanding of what it means for things in, in D to be isomorphic then you could transfer that understanding to what it means for things in C to be isomorphic, right? This is the sort of general idea, right? Because if you want to know whether things in C are isomorphic, you can transform them into things in D, figure out if they're isomorphic there, and that tells you if they're isomorphic in C. All right, so this is essentially saying that uh, it's, it's, if, if any understanding of isomorphism in D tells you something about isomorphisms in C. And again, it, it can be that things are, are what's called Borel complete, right? So, so you're Borel complete, if the class of graphs is Borel reducible to you. And again, because graphs are sort of universal in this sense, that means that uh, any, any class of structures is Borel reducible to C if, if C is Borel complete. Right? So these are things where you're Borel complete, that means that the that deciding isomorphisms, right, the isomorphism relation is, is as complicated as possible. So the, the same proofs that Hirschfeld and Kishana and Stroh and Slinko gave uh, for all those classes that, that they proved were universal. Uh, these also give proofs that they're, they're Borel complete. Um, but Friedman and Stanley, in, in the paper where they introduced this, this theory of Borel reductions, they showed that there's other classes that are also Borel complete. So they showed that trees, linear orders, and fields of any fixed characteristic, these are all also Borel complete. Right? So they're, 
It's not proving that they're universal in the sense that they have every computability theoretic property, but they're they're quite complicated in the sense that it's it's the their isomorphism relations are are as complicated as possible. Um, so let's dig into these. So linear orders we already know are not universal in the sense that they're not complete for uh, computable dimension, right? So as we said previously, any computable linear order has either dimension one or omega, right? It can't have dimension two, for example. So the linear orders are not universal. What about fields? Uh, so fields were recently added to the list of things that are universal. So uh, this is a theorem of uh, Miller, Park, and Schlappentock. They showed that fields of character zero are complete. So, so we can add those to the, the list of universal things. And, and that leaves trees. So what about trees? Are, are trees universal? So the first thing we might do is we should look at why the trees are Borel complete. Uh, right, so what's, what's the proof that Friedman and Stanley gave? And the main idea, right, if, if you sort of dig into their proof and, and you separate it out, you see the main idea is this thing called the, the tree of tuples, uh, what we're gonna call it. So, so you have a structure A. Um, we're gonna come up with a, a labeled tree associated to A. So by a labeled tree, I mean that um, each node is labeled with, say, a natural number. Um, and this labeled tree is basically going to be, what you do is you take the tuples from A and you order them by inclusion, right? So, so at the root of the tree T of A, you have the, the empty tuple. Its children are all the single elements from A. Their children, right, so the child of a single element is all of the two tuples that extend that one tuple. Right, and then you have at the third level, you have the three tuples that extend the two tuples and so on, going all the way up. And then we need to put labels on them. So for every tuple, I'm just going to label it by uh, a good old coding for its atomic diagram. All right, so basically, we, we see the, the tuples getting bigger and bigger, and we see what their atomic diagrams are. Um, and then, right, so you could either do it so that, that every child appears once, or you could say, like, among the children of the, the empty tuple, we're going to repeat infinitely many times each one tuple. And among each one tuple, we're going to repeat infinitely many times each two tuple. So this is the, the tree T of A is just you, you repeat each node once. And the tree T infinity of A, uh, you repeat each node infinitely many times, right? So every tuple appears infinitely many times. So, so we call this the tree of tuples, right? It, it's made up of all the tuples. Um, and you can think of it really as coding like the back in, and forth information. Um, and the standard back and forth argument, which I'm going to show in sort of pictures on the next slide, says that two structures are isomorphic if and only if their tree of tuples is isomorphic. Right? And that's going to mean that, that T or T infinity, these give a Borel reduction that takes graphs to labeled trees. Right? So we're not at trees yet, we're just at labeled trees, but we have a Borel reduction already. So, so what's the argument that, that if A and B are isomorphic, if and only if T, that, that two trees are isomorphic? So let's take two structures. And let's imagine, right, the A is going to consist of elements A1, A2, A3, and so on. And B is going to have B1, B2, B3, and so on. Um, so I think it's, it's pretty clear that if A and B are isomorphic, then the trees that you get from them are also isomorphic. Right? So the, the sort of really interesting direction is to say, suppose that the two trees, T of A and T of B, are isomorphic. Uh, it's called isomorphism F. And now we want to show that the A and B are isomorphic. And, and we're going to use a back and forth argument. So what we do basically is we, we have these two trees out there, and we know they're isomorphic. And the first thing we ask is, okay, where are we going to map A1 to? And so what we do is we say we, we look at the child of the, or the, the one tuple A1. We say, where does it map to by F? Because right? we've, we've got this isomorphism between the two trees. And it's going to have to map to something at the first level, right, which represents a one tuple from B. So maybe A1 maps to, to B3. So then we're going to say, okay, we're going to set up our isomorphism from A to B. It's going to map A1 to B3. And now, right now, so that's the, so the fourth, right now we have to go back. So we say, okay, let's take the first thing in, in B that we haven't mapped yet, say B1, and, and what should we map it to in A, right? Or what in A should we map to B1? And we've already committed, right? We've already committed to mapping A1 to B3. So what we want to do is we want to look uh, at extensions of B3, right? So we're going to look up there at the tuple B3, B1, and we're going to say, where does it map to? So, Right, because A1 maps to B3, then the extensions are going to have to map above the extensions. Right, so B3, B1 is going to map, say, to the tuple A1, A2. Right? And then we're going to say, okay, A2 has to map to B1 now. Right? And then we have to go forth again and back. And essentially what we're going to do is we're going to, take, uh, we're going to identify a path through each of the trees with a path through the other tree. Um, and of course, right, these are labeled trees. 
So that means that A1 has the same label as B3, which means they have the same atomic type, right? And the tuple A1, A2 is gonna have the same atomic type as the tuple B3, B1, and so on, right? So because we're matching up the labels, the, the identification of elements from A and B that we get, right, they're gonna have the, the same diagram, right? And so that means it's gonna be an isomorphism, right? So this is, right, you should think of, of the trees as being really the, what, what's the back and forth information of the structure, right? Because you can, you can see, right, for example, you can see all the one tuples, and then for any one tuple, you can see the two tuples that extend it and so on. Um, and sort of where the information is hidden is, is that the structure itself sort of lives as paths to these trees, right? But, but not every path corresponds to the structure, right? So on, only the paths that are, are onto, right? And so by the back and forth argument, right, we can sort of build a path that's, that contains the entire structure as we go up, right? That, that every element in the structure appears in the tuple at some point. So, so this is this, this sort of going to be the, the central object of this talk is this, this tree of tuples. And we're thinking of it as coding the, the back and forth information. Um, now, the tree of tuples is a label tree. And, and I kind of want to say something about just trees without labels. But there's a pretty easy way of converting a label tree into a tree that, that really codes the same thing. So, so say I have some tree and a tree with labels. So say, uh, say I have a tree T. The root node is labeled S, right? S is a natural number. And I've got all these subtrees T1, T2, T3, and so on. So I'm going to replace it by a tree T tilde, right? Which looks like this. So, so what am I going to do? I'm going to add this, this extra branch off there, which then splits twice. And then it goes up S nodes, and then it splits twice at the end. So what I can do is I can easily recover the number S, right? Because what I do is I look for a child that then has a two children, right? So that gets me that, that one particular branch. And then I count how many extensions does it have until it splits twice. And that tells me what S is. Right? So I can recover the label here. And then what I want to do is, right, I have all these subtrees. So I want to sort of recursively do the same thing to, to all those subtrees, right? So the, the subtree T1, it has some label of its root node, right? I'm going to add one of these branches that goes off to the side, right, with the two split. And then it's going to recursively do this, this all the way through the tree, right? So basically what I'm doing is I'm, I'm taking the tree and I'm, uh, extending it a little bit, adding, adding these extra branches that tell me what the label should be, and then adding this little thing with the, the two branches versus the one branch to tell me, um, am I looking at sort of a, a extra little label thing, or am I looking at um, a subtree? Right. So, so this gives me a way of turning uh, label trees into trees. You can cover the labels. They're, they're essentially the same in terms of, right? again, one of these sort of reductions of they have all the same computability theoretic properties. So, uh, Basically, we're, we're going to talk mostly about label trees, but really we're talking about trees in some sense. It's just, I don't want to, right? We don't want to always have to talk about these, these weird branches and, and all this weird stuff. So, right, so then composing these two things, right? So if you take a structure A, you get its, its tree of tuples, and then you do this thing where you turn the label tree into just a tree, right? This shows that the class of trees is, is Borel complete. So that's essentially the Friedman-Stanley argument. Um, so they, they didn't quite separate it into these two steps, but but that's really what they did is, is they took the, the tree of tuples and then they coded it into, into the tree itself. All right, so then, right, we haven't answered yet, are trees universal? We have this, this sort of one reduction. And what we're really asking is, is, is there some structure that has some reasonable computably theoretic property um, such that there's no tree that has the same property, right? So is there some property that, that can't be realized within trees? Um, so maybe the first thing to do is to look at some examples. So let's, let's find some examples of interesting computably theoretic properties and see, can we come up with a tree that has the same property? Um, so often when we come up with, with interesting examples of things, we, we do some kind of coding. And the most basic kind of coding is to code in a, a single set. So if we have a, a set of natural numbers, we say it's CE coded in a structure A. If the set can always be computably enumerated from any presentation of A. Right, so basically you think of A somehow like intrinsically contains this information X because it, any copy of A always computes, or always enumerates X. And um, with all this coding stuff, there's, there's sort of a, a whole, whole bunch of different kinds of theorems for different things. And, and in this case for C coding, it's this theorem of night that tells you exactly how structures would have to CE code things. Right, so uh, a set X is CE coded in a structure A if and only if the set X is enumeration reducible to the existential type of the tuple from A, right? So what do I mean by the existential type of the tuple? Uh, basically, it's, it's the set of all good old codes for all of the existential formulas 
that are true of this type. Right? And and why so so intuitively what's going on here? Well, you have this structure, right? You have this fixed tuple. And if I know what this tuple is, I can start enumerating all the existential formulas that are true of it. And then using that enumeration, right? Because I can now enumerate the set X, right? Because the set X is enumeration reducible to that, right? So basically what I, I do is in some arbitrary copy of A, I start looking at, like, I start looking for existential formulas that are true. Uh, as I find witnesses, I start realizing that they're true, right? So I get an enumeration of the existential type, and then I can enumerate X, right? So in some sense, the way you should think of it is the, the existential types are the sort of maximal things uh, that are enumeration reducible to, to A, that are CE coded in A, right? And anything else CE coded in A, is enumeration reducible to one of these maximal things that is C encoded. So this is the simplest type of coding, and it's pretty easy to do this into a tree, right? So if we have the set, say, like one, two, five, and we want to code it into a tree, um, then we can code it like this, right? So basically, we split for, for each number that we might want to code, right? We, we split into a new branch. Then, so to code one, right, we go up once and then we split. To code uh, two, we go up twice and then we split. To code five, we go up five times and then we split. Right, so it's pretty easy to recover one, two, and five from any copy of this tree, right? Because you, you just basically count how long is it until I split, and when you split, then you, you can enumerate that. Right, so coding sets into trees is, is quite easy. Uh, the next step up is to code families of sets. So, so here we have to talk about what is a, an enumeration of a countable family. So we have a family F of, of subsets of natural numbers. Um, and an enumeration basically is a, a set W, which we're thinking of as like a grid. And if you look at all of the columns in this grid, you get the sets in F. Um, right, so this is an enumeration because, and, and the, the order of the columns might be different, right? But, but all that I want is that the, the set of all the columns, right, the collection of columns gives me the same collection of sets that, that the family is. And um, sometimes there's sort of issues with multiplicity. So we're gonna assume that in, in any enumeration of the family, every column is repeated infinitely many times. And then the family is computably enumerable in a set X if X can enumerate the family, right? So X, there's a CE in X enumeration of this family. And the family is C coded in a structure if it can be computably enumerated from the atomic diagram of any copy of A, right? So no matter what copy of A I look at, I can still enumerate uh, an enumeration of the family. And, and this has sort of been, uh, a huge way of coming up with all sorts of different examples um, in computable structure theory, right? So the, and, and we can do this in trees. So say we have a family, right? W1, W2, W3. So each of W1, W2, W3, those are all sets of natural numbers. We know that we can come up with a, a tree that codes each of these sets, right? We did that sort of two slides ago. And now what we're gonna do is we're just gonna make a tree that puts all those together, right? So basically we're gonna have the root node, we're gonna have a child for each set in the family. And then we're going to do this thing we did before where we code that set in the subtree above there, right? So now you can, if you have a copy of this tree, you can enumerate the family because you just say, okay, let's go for each child of the root and let's enumerate that set and then enumerate this set to the second child and the enumerate the set corresponding to the third child and so on. And, and you get enumeration of the family. So basically this is saying, right, if you have, if you have any family, you can code it into a tree, right? Any, every family is CE coded into to some tree. All right, so trees, right, basically, the, they're, they're very, they're good at coding things in, in, in this sense. And, and this ability of trees to code these families immediately lets us build lots of interesting trees. All right, so I'm going to go through three examples of, of constructions where um, someone built a, a family of sets and then turned it into a structure, and then we'll, we'll turn it into a tree. So a really cool example is, is this example of Slayman and Boehner. Um, so they showed that there's a family of finite sets, and this family can be enumerated by every non-computable degree, but it can't be computably enumerated. And what they did was they turned that into uh, a structure that has degree spectrum exactly the non-computable degrees, right? And um, what we can do is we can turn it right into a, a tree whose degree spectrum is not exactly the non-computable degrees, right? All you do is you take this tree that, that codes this family, and if you have a copy of the tree, then you can enumerate the family. And if you have an enumeration of the family, then you can build a copy of the tree, right? So basically you get the, the degree spectrum of the tree is exactly the, the things that can enumerate this family. Um, so another example is uh, for computable dimension two. So the way Goncharov showed this was he came up with a family of sets. 
And uh, I guess I haven't exactly said what computable equivalence means, but it means essentially what you would think it should. But this family of sets has two different computable enumerations, and any that, that are not computably equivalent, right? and any other computable enumeration is equivalent to one of these two. And if you do this construction to turn this into a tree, then you find out that there's a, a tree with computable dimensions. Right? So again, we're building a, another interesting example of a computable tree with some, some nice properties. Um, and then one last thing is you can do the same thing, right? So if you're trying to show that there are uh, trees that are, if there are structures that are computably categorical, but not relatively computably categorical, uh, this is done again by, by constructing a family and, and coding the family into, into something. So you can get a tree with the same property. So, uh, so far at least, when we're considering sort of some computably theoretic property this structure might have, trees have always seemed to be on the side of the universal structures because we've, we've been able to build examples of trees. And despite this, they, they didn't show up on the, the list of things that were complete for degree spectra and, and all these properties. And so then you can ask, well, why, why is that? Maybe the first thing to ask is, what is it about these transformations that, that were used by Hirschfeld, Hussein, Schwer, and Slinko that, like, what is it about this transformation that caused them to maintain all these properties? And uh, sort of a suggestion when, when there was this uh, addition of fields to the list of universal structures, uh, this paper had a, a nice formulation using computable functors of what was going on. And uh, around the same time, uh, Antonio was thinking about affected by interpretations. And it turns out that these are really the same and they give an explanation of, of what's going on in these, these particular transformations. So uh, to do uh, interpretations, we're gonna have relations, right? The relations are gonna be relations on finite tuples of A uh, of arbitrary size. And uh, a relations uh, uniformly relatively intrinsically computable, basically if it's defined by a, a computable sigma one formula without parameters, uh, which is the same as being uniformly computable in and relative to, to every copy of, of the structure. Uh, that should be of A, sorry. So, so uniformly relatively intrinsically computable means basically computably definable by a, a sigma one formula. And then, uh, so we can take this idea of interpretations that it's in model theory and, and move it into sort of this computable realm with, with these computable sigma one formulas. Right, so it's essentially the standard definition of interpretations, but, but using these special formulas. So you say something's effective, A is effectively interpretable in B, basically means that the A is definable inside of B. Uh, and what this means is that you can, you can sort of define a subset of B that's, that's the domain of A, and you can define relations, uh, right? Every relation in A, you can define inside of B, again, all by, by sigma one formulas. And you can define an equivalence relation so basically what you do is you, you take the domain modulo the equivalence relation, you take all these definable relations, right? And this is gonna give you a copy of A that's sitting inside of B, right? So, so A is interpretable inside of B. Right, so basically what you're saying, right? This is essentially saying that the A is definable inside of B by these nice sigma one computable formulas. Um, and then, right, a bi interpretation should go both ways. So, so A and B are effectively bi interpretable if there's an effective interpretation of A inside of B, an effective interpretation of B inside of A. Uh, and then there should be something about the composition of those two. So, right, what we think is, is you have the domain of A inside of B that sits inside of B, and it's, it's isomorphic to A by, by this map, right? And then inside of A, you've got a copy of B, which, right, so you can think of the copy of B inside of A, and then you can think of that as sitting inside of B. So what you've really got is you've got a, a copy of B that sits inside of B. And what we ask is that the, the isomorphism between the, the larger B and the smaller B inside of it, that should be definable, right? And the same thing for the, you have A and you have a copy of B inside of A, and you have the copy of A inside of B inside of A, and the isomorphism between those two copies of A, that should be sigma one definable, right? So this is essentially saying each of the structures is definable inside of each other, and there's some nice way of composing the, the definitions, right? So, Essentially the same thing as, as model theoretic by interpretability, but with these, these computable formulas. And, and the interesting thing, so if, so if you have a copy of B, then you can actually build the copy of A, right? Because the formulas are sigma one, you can recognize when something's in the domain, you can recognize when something's in a relation. Um, so, so you can actually, given a copy of B, you can build the copy of A. And it turns out that this is a, a functor, right? So, so the category we're gonna look at is the category of, of all the copies of A, right? Or, or the category of all the copies of B. And the morphisms are, are isomorphisms between different copies of A. Uh, 
Um, right, so a functor, we're going to think of functors from, from the copies of A to copies of B. What does that do? That, that takes each copy of A and it assigns it a copy of B. And for any isomorphism between two different copies of A, we get an isomorphism between the two different copies of B. Right, so it's basically reducing copies of A and isomorphisms between things in A to copies of B and isomorphisms between things in B uh, in this functorial way. Right, so you should have it, uh, the things should compose nicely. And a functor is computable if you can do this with, with computable operators, right? So there's a computable operator that turns copies of A into copies of B, and there's a computable operator that turns isomorphisms between things in A to isomorphisms between things in B. So if you have a, an interpretation of A inside of B, then you get a functor from B to A, right? Because if you take a, an isomorphism between copies of B, they each have copies of A sitting inside of them, and the isomorphism goes down to the, the two copies of A. Uh, and in fact, if you have a by interpretation, you get more, right? Because if you have a by interpretation, you get a, a functor from copies of A to copies of B, and a functor from copies of B to copies of A. Um, and then there was this extra thing about the compositions of the interpretations, and this will get you something about the compositions between the, the functors. So, so say we have two functors. Uh, we're going to say that they're effectively isomorphic. Uh, if there's a, a computable turn functional uh, that sort of maps between them. Right, so, so this diagram is going to have to commute. So if we have some copy of A, and the functor maps it to a copy of B, and the other functor, G, maps it to a different copy of B. So, right, so we have two different copies of B. And what should happen is that this, this lambda should give an isomorphism between the two different copies of B that's determined only by the, the initial copy of A. Right, so essentially we can, uh, in a computable way, we can move between the images of F. And then you want a little bit more, right? So if you have some other copy of A that's isomorphic, you get its two copies of B by F and G, right? Of course, those should be isomorphic by, by lambda should tell you what the isomorphism is gonna do. And then the functor is gonna tell you, right, how to transfer between those two, right? The functor F is gonna tell you how to transfer between the two functor, the, the F of A's, right? And G is gonna tell you how to transfer between the G of A's. And then you want this whole diagram to commute. So everything works out nicely, right? So basically, Lambda tells you how to transfer between F and G in a way that it's, it's very well behaved. All right, so you can think of it basically as you know, F and G are technically different functors uh, in the sense that they give technically different things, but they're essentially the same in the sense that you know how to, how to move between F and G in a, in a very nice way. Uh, and then we say that the A and B are, are computably bitransformable if there's a functor that goes from A to B and a functor that goes from B to A. And both the compositions, right, we, you're, for sort of technical reasons of you know what the domains actually are and stuff, you can't you can't actually ask that the that the comp, that they're inverses, the F and G are inverses. But the best you can ask is that they're almost inverses in the sense that their compositions are effectively isomorphic to the identity. Right. So this means that if you take F, right, so you, from F you go from a copy of A to a copy of B, then G takes that copy of B to a copy of A. You really want it to be the same copy of A that it started with. It won't quite be, but but it'll be really easy to see how they're isomorphic. And so we have these sort of two perspectives, right? One using these uh, by interpretations, the other using these transformations and these functors. Uh, and we prove that these are the, the same, right? So uh, A and B are effectively by interpretable if and only if they're computably by transformable. And if they're computably by transformable, uh, in particular, they're going to have the same automorphism group. Um, so this is just a, a for in the, in the sort of computable category, this is just a, a one way direction. So we have this sort of idea of, of what it means, right? You should really think of this as, as the two structures are like really almost essentially the same. And in particular, if two structures are effectively bi-interpretable, then they have the same degree spectrum, they have the same Scott rank, the same computable dimension, and, and basically any reasonable, again, any reasonable computably theoretic property, uh, they're gonna share. So, right, this idea of universality, we can sort of maybe in a more formal sense, Without, without having to list out all the properties we care about, right? We can say that a class is universal if any time you have a graph, it's effectively bi-interpretable with a, a structure in C. Right? In particular, if you're, if you're universal in this sense, then you're complete for um, degree spectrum and computable dimension and, and all of these things. In the, right? So universal in this sense is universal in sort of the, the informal sense from, from before. And all of the proofs that, that things were complete for all this list of properties, they actually give proofs that these things are universal, right? So uh, these, these transformations that were in this paper of Hirschfeld, Kusanov, Schwarz, and Slinko, those are actually um, 
by interpretations between graphs and, and things in these classes. All right, and same thing, right? Of course, this paper uh, about fields uh, introduced this idea of transformations, and but but fields are, are also universal in this sense. All right, so this gives us sort of a, a stronger way of saying that things are universal um, without having to to list this sort of ad hoc list of properties. Uh, so let's return to trees now, right? So we have this this sort of more formal idea of universality. So trees were Borel complete. Um, but it's easy to see that they're not universal in the sense of, of biinterpretability. Uh, this is because they're, they're simple structures, like really simple structures, like the integers with the successor operator. Um, and these are not effectively biinterpretable with any tree. Um, so I'm, I'm not naming any constants in here, just basically just a chain of, of successors. Right? And, and the reason is that if two things were effectively biinterpretable, then they would have to have the same automorphism group. Um, the automorphism group of, of the integers with the successors is the integers again, right? Your automorphisms are basically just shifting back and forth. Uh, but the integers is not the automorphism group of any tree, right? So in a tree, um, they have sort of very specific automorphism groups. And the reason is if, if one, um, if you fix, so if you fix the root and you map one child of the root to a different child of the root, then that means that the subtrees above those children are actually isomorphic. So you can actually, basically you can, if two things are in the same orbit, then you can actually permute the orbits however you like, right? So in particular, if you have um, a tree with a non-trivial automorphism, that means that there's, there's some orbit that is non-trivial, and then you can just take two things in that orbit and swap them, right? And so you get an automorphism of order two. And of course, right, the integers don't have order two, so this is basically saying that, that if you had the automorphism group of integers, or if the, the integer is embedded into the automorphism group of the tree, then you'd have to have a whole bunch of other automorphisms as well. So, right, so now we have some structure, some very simple structure that's not effectively biinterpretable with, with any tree. Um, right, so that means that the trees are not universal in the sense of, of biinterpretability. But this is sort of a, an unsatisfying argument because what we really care about is we, we care about computability theoretic properties, right? And this automorphism group is sort of this very technical thing, it's a, a sort of technical barrier. It's not being universal. So what we'd really like to come up with is, is a computably theoretic property that we can't get within the class of trees. Um, problem is, we, we had all these examples of things that you could get within trees. And I actually, I don't know of a reasonable computably theoretic property. Maybe someone, I've asked a bunch of people and, and no one I've asked knows of one. If anyone does know of one, that would be very interesting. Uh, but I, I can't think of any computably theoretic property that, that you can't get in a tree. Um, now, a natural candidate would be to find some degree spectrum, which is not the degree spectrum of the tree. Um, so again, I don't know, right, we can build all sorts of different degree spectrums in trees. Um, and basically, every way that people have built degree spectrum, you can transform into a tree. Um, but we still don't have a general method of doing it. So right, the question is, is every degree spectrum the degree spectrum of the tree? And one particular way to prove this, to, if the answer was going to be yes, would be to show that if you take a structure A, and you take its tree of tuples, if you could prove that those have the same degree spectrum, then you would know that every degree spectrum is the degree spectrum of the tree. Right? And basically what this is asking, right? given the structure A, you can always compute a copy of the tree of tuples. And this is essentially asking, given the tree of tuples, can I compute back the structure A? Right? So, so that's the question. If, if, I, if I have a copy of the tree of tuples, can I compute back the structure A? And so this is the sort of the main theorem that I want to talk about, and we'll talk about for all reasons stuff later. But the answer is no. So there, there's some structure A. A doesn't have any computable copies, but its tree of tuples does have a computable copy. All right. So in particular, there, there's a copy of the tree of tuples that can't compute a copy of the structure A. Right. And again, we're, we're thinking of the tree of tuples as the sort of back and forth information of the structure. Right. And this is saying that there's a structure that you can't computably recover from its back and forth information. So there's, there's something more to the structure in it than just the back and forth, right? There's something sort of intrinsically what the structure is that, that you can't get just from back and forth. Um, or in a computable way, obviously, right? Because the back and forth, pro like the back and forth structure determines the isomorphism type, but, but you can't do that computably. Um, so one way to think of this is, is that pass through, right? So that pass through the tree of tuples correspond to substructures of A. And so if you had a very generic path, then it would actually hit sort of a, a path that, that is onto A. And so you could recover A from the tree of tuples together with a sufficiently generic 
again, but though, so right, so it's, it's this sort of this, the, the information missing from the tree of tuples really is something very generic, right? Because we know that anything that CE coded in A is also CE coded in T of A, right? So if, if every copy of A computes something, then every copy of the tree will compute the same set, right? So it's really this, this sort of generic information that's, that's what's missing. Um, right, so again, this means that the A and the tree of tuples don't always have the same degree spectrum, right? There's a particular example where they don't have the same degree spectrum, but we haven't shown that there is a degree spectrum, which is not the degree spectrum of any tree, right? We've, we've essentially said, here's, here's one way of trying to prove that it doesn't work, right? But we haven't proved that, that there's no sort of, right? There might be like a different method for every degree spectrum. There might be a different method for, for getting a tree with that degree spectrum. Um, and we haven't proved that, that you can't do that. So, right, so that question is, is every degree spectrum the degree spectrum for a tree? Uh, that I still don't know the answer to. We've just shown that the one method doesn't work for proving that. Um, uh, so, right, this was, was sort of computability, computable. Using marker extensions, you can push this way up the, the hyperarithmetic hierarchy. Um, right, so this is just actually a very easy corollary. For any computable ordinal alpha, there is some structure that has no delta alpha computable copies, but the tree of tuples still has a computable copy. So, right, this is saying that even with a bunch of jumps, you still can't use the tree to build a copy of the structure back. Uh, and again, this ties in with sort of this genericness, right? That the information that T needs to build A really is something sort of way, way off to the side, right? It's not, it's not some number of jumps, it's something very, very generic. Um, so I also want to mention, so around the same time that we were doing this, uh, Julia Knight and um, Siskova and Vatev, they showed independently that, that there's no uh, L omega, one omega formulas that uniformly interpret a structure A in the tree T of A, right? So, so there's no interpretation of A in this tree. Um, and this follows as a, a corollary of, of this corollary, right? Because imagine that A was interpreted in T of A using sigma alpha formulas um, relative to some X, right? Then you relativize this corollary to X, but that would mean is that any, from any copy of T of A, you could, using delta alpha, you could compute a copy of A, right? And we, we know that there's some example where you can't do this. Um, but this is a, a similar thing that says sort of uh, something about you, you can't recover A from the, the tree of tuples. Uh, sorry about the dogs. <laughs> uh, um, so let's return back to, to talking about uh, C coding a little bit, because we can, we can say some interesting things about this. So suppose that you have a set X that's, that's CE coded by A, right? So that meant that every copy of A could enumerate the set X. Then we had this theorem that said ex exactly how this happens, right? That, that you're CE coded, that means that your enumeration reducible to some existential type. Right? And those are sort of the things that are, are the maximal things that are CE coded within A. Um, Right? And if this happens, then you actually are also CE coded by the tree of tuples, right? Because basically you, the, the, the information in the existential types, that's available in the tree of tuples, right? Because um, right, if, you have, if you have a node and you look at all the extensions, that tells you all the, the atomic diagrams of extensions, and that's enough to, to see the existential type. So, so the, the structure in the tree, those, those CE code the same sets. Um, so now let's look at, at families. So, how might you sort of naturally enumerate, uh, like uniformly code a family? Um, so let's, let's take a list of all the, the enumeration operators at a, a standard list. And what you might have is, um, this is gonna be a uniform coding. So you might have a, a sigma one computable formula called phi. So a list of, of sigma one computable formulas, phi L. And basically what the phi L are gonna choose is they're gonna choose various tuples from your structure. And you're gonna look at the existential types of those tuples. You're going to use the enumeration operator to, to enumerate some other set, and that's going to be your family, right? So, so essentially what you're doing is you're saying, okay, I'm going to pick out an enumeration of elements in my structure in a, in a nice way, right? A definable way. Each of those types is going to enumerate its existential type, and each of those existential types is going to enumerate some set. Right? So that's a very natural way to, to code a family. And right, so, so, if, so if this happens, right, obviously that you code the family, if you have a family that's uniformly C coded in a structure A, then the best result we knew was that there's a sigma three set of formulas, phi L, that, that codes it like this, right? So, and the problem is this is not an if and only if theorem, right? 
because if you only have a sigma three set of formulas, then you don't have a computable way to decide which are the types that you want to use to enumerate sets, right? You have to, um, does that make sense? So, right, so, so if you have sigma one formulas, you can list all the types that you want to use. If you have sigma three formulas, you can't come up with a list, right? You, you don't know which types to use to enumerate sets. Um, so then in natural question, right, to get an if and only if you want to have the, the sigma three, you want to strengthen to, to sigma one formulas. Um, and you can't do this. And, and the argument comes from this, this looking at the trees and the, the tree of tuples. So as the, the structure A, right, let's have B this computable structure, the structure with no computable copies, but its tree of tuples does have a computable copy. And let's look at the Slim and Vayner family, right? So this was the family that had an enumeration in every non-computable degree, but it didn't have a computable enumeration. So then this family is C coded by the structure A, right? Because any copy of the structure A is non-computable, that means it enumerates us to the family A. But the tree of tuples T alpha of A, it can't see code the family, right? Because the, the tree of tuples, it has a computable copy, and that computable copy can't enumerate the family. Now, if the family was coded in A using a sigma one computable formula phi, then for the same reason as with, with just coding sets, right? Then that, that family would also be C coded in the tree of tuples, right? The tree of tuples, you could, you could look for those, those types in the tree and you could look at their existential uh, types and you could enumerate things in the same way, right? So basically, if, if something was coded using this very nice method, then you could again code it into the tree of tuples, right? We know you can't code it into the tree of tuples, so that means that, that there's some structure, right? This this particular structure we built, and there's a family F, in particular the the Slim and Vayner family, and F is C coded in the structure A, but it's not done in this nice way, right? So there's no uniformly computable list of formulas that that codes it in this, in this way, right? So this means that the Essentially, you should think of it saying that there's, right, like, like whenever you code a set, it's coded in a nice way. But there's a way of coding families of sets that aren't coded in a nice way. It's somehow, um, there's some sort of mystery to, to why they get coded in, right? It's not, it's not a coding into the, the types or the back and forth, right? It's some kind of coding that's, uh, I don't know, just, just mysterious somehow. Um, now, if we wanted everything to work nicely, we can sort of say, uh, a strengthening of, of the kind of coding that we want to do to, to make things work nicely. So uh, we can say a family is functorially CE coded. So this means that the, it's CE coded, right? There's this computable operator. And if you have two different copies of A, right, they each enumerate the family F. And to be functorially coded, what that means is that, right, so those, those two enumerations, they're, um, they're permutations of each other because they code the same family. And to be functorially coded, what that means is that from an isomorphism between the two structures, you can produce a permutation of those two enumerations uh, that maps one to the other, right? So it's sort of nice in the sense that by, by changing the structure, you change the enumeration and, and you have some kind of understanding about how the enumeration changes from, from changing the copy of the structure you're looking at. And, right, so this is sort of a, a natural way for things, right? It's, it's a nice way for things to be coded. And, uh, Right now, you can prove the, the if and only if, right? So if, if, if a family is functorially C coded, that means that there is this list of these formulas that, that isolate the types, right? A sigma one list of formulas, and you code it in this, this nice natural syntactic way, right? So essentially, most of the time when people build things that are coded, what they're building is something that's, that's functorially C coded, right? In this, this nice way. Um, so we talked about sets, we talked about families of sets. Um, of course, there's, there's also sometimes you want to look at families of families of sets and families of families of families of sets. Um, and these arise naturally in all sorts of different places. There's been constructions where people use these things, um, particularly when you use mark extensions, right? If you, if you have a construction that's, that's done using, say, families of sets, and you think of taking a mark extension of this construction, then you're going to sort of naturally look at families of families of sets. Um, right? So you can talk about, say, n families, which are families of depth n. Uh, you can do this by an ordinal alpha. Or you can even just say, I'm going to have the families be, be non-well bounded, right? So basically I have a family, inside the family are other families, but there are also elements of, there are also natural numbers, right? Each of those families themselves have more families and other natural numbers and so on all the way down. And if you think about what these are, they're, they're really essentially the same thing as, as labeled trees, right? Or uh, we can say replicated labeled trees because we wanted everything to appear, you know, every, every column of the enumeration should appear infinitely many times, right? So you're thinking basically is, you know, the, the family is like, like, like you have the root node, which is the, the whole family, and then its children represent themselves, subfamilies, 
and their children represent sub subfamilies. And, and the labels let us put in natural numbers into there. Um, right, so we have this, this tree of tuples, uh, which is naturally a replicated label tree. It's coded functorially in, in A, right? If we move A around, we, we move the tree around. Um, and it's really the, it's the maximal replicated label tree coded, uh, right? So, so in this theorem, we sort of basically were saying that, that this is the, like, like before we said sort of that the, the existential types are really the maximal things that are the maximal sets coded, C coded in the structure, right? And that the, this thing where you take all the types and the formula, that's really the way of, of coding uh, family, right? This is really saying that the, the maximal thing that's, that's C, the maximal family of families of families that C coded in a structure really is this, this tree of tuples, right? As long as we require that the coding is, is functorial, right? So that we have to put this assumption that the coding is, is somewhat nice. And then we get, so, right? So the tree of tuples is functorially reducible to A, right? And every other replicated label tree that's functorially reducible to A, you can reduce it to T infinity, right? So, so it's sort of, um, it, it, you can think of it as like interpreting or um, sitting in any, in, in any functorial reduction, right? It sort of sits inside. You can, you can decompose any functorial reduction into two steps, right? And so this sort of says like, the, it says something that, that this tree of tuples is somehow a, a quite natural object, right? It's, it's the maximal object that, that can do a certain thing. All right, so uh, so this is the last slide. Uh, basically, what, what did we learn? Essentially, we, we learned that you can have a structure that, that can code information in, in some way that's not captured by its back and forth structure, right? Um, now, from all the examples we had, right, we learned that sort of we don't, we don't actually, in, in the course of normal computability structure theory, we don't really use this much that often, right? Most of the things we actually do, we code into the back and forth structure. But it is possible to code things in a way, in a different way, right? And it's and it's this way that's somehow recoverable by by something very generic, right? But it's still somehow sort of um, a little mystical how the information actually shows up in the structure, right? It's but it shows up for some reason that doesn't seem like a very solid reason. Um, and it'd be interesting to to see if there are other ways that you can use this kind of coding to get things that that we haven't been able to do so far. Um, and then. So a conjecture, uh, there's this question about whether every degree spectrum is the degree spectrum of the tree. My guess is that there is some degree spectrum that's not the degree spectrum of the tree. And, and there's some reasoning to this, um, right? One thing is, so if you have, if, it's, if it was true that every degree spectrum was the degree spectrum of the tree, you would expect that this is witnessed by some kind of nice transformation, right? That, that you take a graph, G, that realizes this, this degree spectrum, and there's this transformation that turns it into a tree, right? And that this should be a uniform, right? You somehow expect it to be uniform, right? It's not that, you know, you take some degree spectrum, you, you look at some ad hoc method, you build a tree, some other degree spectrum, you build a tree, but in, in a different way, right? You expect that there's some kind of construction. If it was true that, that every degree spectrum could be turned into a tree, there should be a single construction that, that should do it um, for everything. Then among all these sorts of constructions, these transformations, this, this tree of tuples seems to have some kind of special place as the, the strongest transformation, right? Uh, it's hard to think of any kind of transformation that from, from graphs into trees that um, sort of captures something that this, this tree of tuples doesn't catch, right? So uh, again, right, the strongest is, is in quotes. It's, I'm not, what does strongest actually mean? It's not quite clear, but it's, this, this seems to be the strongest possible construction. Um, and we know that this particular construction doesn't work, right? We know that, that A can code things that T, T infinity of A does not, right? So essentially this, this argument for this conjecture is that, you know, if, 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 if it was good, if the conjecture was gonna be false, there'd be some uniform way that it would be false. Um, we have some candidate for sort of the best possible way to make it false and that way doesn't work, right? So then, then we expect the conjecture to be true. Um, but the proof is gonna be, have to be something uh, quite complicated because any natural degree spectrum that we come up with uh, doesn't work. And, and actually, you know, I've, we've looked at the, the proof of this theorem that there is a structure A that's not computable, that the tree is computable. And it, it's not even clear how to look at that construction and see for that particular construction, what is the degree spectrum of the structure? That's not even clear. Um, and so let alone coming up with a degree spectrum in general that, that you can't do in any way, uh, seems like a very hard task, but again, uh, I think a very interesting question. All right, thank you for listening. <laughs>
Uh, thank you very much for interesting talk. Uh, so do anyone uh, have a, a question or comment? Hi, Nati. I have a question. Um, so have you, if you looked at all the things like what happens with dimension with expansion by constants in trees, because that seems like one that would be, like I can't see how, how you can have like a, I mean, it's probably failure of my imagination, right? How you can have like a computably categorical tree that when you expand it by constant, the dimension goes to infinity or something like that. Yeah, I didn't look specifically at that. So that might be a place to look, because that, that somehow seems to like involve automorphisms a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, but I haven't looked at that specifically. Yeah, fair enough. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? It does seem really interesting using the the tree of tuples to to describe um, so many kinds of uh, structures. I guess I've, I've always had a, a bias against the uh, computable dimension, but it even does that. <laughs> yeah, so, and the thing is basically anything that you do in a natural way, it's going to be able to do. You somehow yeah. have to do something in a very, very weird way to have it not be captured by the tree of tuples. Yeah. So why is no, it, it, it seems to why is you it, so much? Sorry, go ahead. Bruce. No. <laughs> why is it that you think that you couldn't have some, uh, constructions that depended on some property of the class of graphs. Um, why should it work the same way for every graph? I think so, yeah, so. That, that seems to me unlikely in some sense. So, so it seems to me unlikely as well, but that's because I think that there probably is one class where there's no way to do it, I guess. Right, it just seems that if, there's, there's so many different classes of graphs, if you needed a different method for every one, then I just feel that you'd probably, there'd probably be some class that you missed, right? That there wasn't a method for. Uh, okay. Like why, why should a whole bunch of ad hoc methods cover all the possibilities, I guess, is the... Well, because one depends on connectivity and one depends on yeah. the, the, the order of the automorphisms. You know, you could have a... Few yeah, so it's, it's certainly possible. It just, uh, it seems unlikely, I guess, to me. Well, I mean, um, I think what, I Dennis, that, that's, what Dennis was suggesting was exactly was that sort of thing that what it depends on what happens when you add on one object or something. And yeah, so I guess um, and, and that adding on one object can have infinitely many different consequences. When you name when you you know yeah. you name one object, you add you divide up into infinitely many different kinds of objects. Though those are all sort of subtrees of the tree of tuples, I guess, right? Uh, all of those objects. But yeah, so it's some, it is sort of the, the kind of thing that might, because part of the problem with the tree of tuples is that you can't, you can't cross identify when two things are the same, right? So if you have, if you have a node at level one, right. you can't figure out which nodes at level two are the same, right? Represent a tuple that contains the node at level one. And so, so things like naming tuples might be the kind of thing that, that a tree can't do. Just because if you, if you name the tuple at level one, then you, you haven't named it a level two at all sorts of other places, I guess. Have you looked at omega categorical structures? 
uh, now, so, so um, essentially what I did is I looked at a list of things and saw that like, I didn't, I didn't do sort of a comprehensive search of, uh, of everything. Uh, I just looked at a bunch of examples, saw that a lot of them are done using families of, of sets. The reason I'm asking is that there are only finally many n tuples for each yeah. n, so it would make a yeah, special I, kind of I, I actually like Andre's comment. Uh, maybe it's, well, one of the things we probably one can do is the code the structure into um, label trees, but put the condition on the trees, like finitely branching trees. That could be interesting. What type of structures you can code into those type of finitely branching label trees. That could be interesting. It's sort of related to Andre's question. So. Yeah, so sort of things where you only need finite many, like, like still infinite structures, but you only need finite many different types of stuff, I guess. Yes. Yeah, that would be what you get from the all of not categoricity. Yeah. Can you code a structure into a tree in such a way that it's recoverable from sufficiently random information? So yeah, so basically what you need to do is need the, the random information, right? So in the tree, um, you could use the random, like use whatever information to build a path, right? And all you need is the path to hit every, every element of the structure at some point it has to show up in the path. So presumably, presumably, uh, I mean, generic certainly. Seems likely. Generic certainly works, yeah. Uh, I'd be a little bit worried for random about, I mean, essentially what you're doing is you're picking a random extension at each point, right? And then you'd have to argue that a, uh, you're probably one or something you, you'd, hit everything at some point. Um, but you're picking among a mega possibility, so you'd have to make sure that the one you're looking for doesn't end up like a smaller and smaller probability every time, I guess. Any other questions or comments? Okay, then if there is nothing else, uh, then uh, we will, yeah, we'd like to close uh, this talk. So thank you very much for your talk. Thanks for listening.